the concrete plastic. So this was the condition of the eye once that the corneal compensation happened before the keratoplasty. And you know, this case had a very uh, fluctuating cornea edema, a very fluctuating uh, cornea thickness, and we uh, uh, could evaluate this by the MS39. Okay. Okay, this is the aspect of the cornea. Look here that we have epithelium hyperplasia. This hyperplasia is very well observed here. We have the cornea. And this is the cornea. This is a, a video that I hold with Ron just and see that we have intrastromal vacuole. So so far I, I knew that we had obviously a bullous keratopathy, but this is intrastromal vacuole, vacuolization of the stroma. This explains why this patient had fluctuating corneal thickness and why this fluctuating corneal thickness was in absence of any corneal uh, bullous uh, keratopathy. So no bullous keratopathy because the patient had epithelial thickening. This epithelial thickening was epithelial hyperplasia. Of, indeed, we had a, a decompensated cornea, but we had the decompensation with intrastromal vacuolization, which is a remarkable finding. I have never seen something like this. We have many cases like this, but this was one of the very first that we had this evidence of the fluctuation of cornea thickness related to the retain of fluid, not interstitial, but in, in cavitation. So the, this very high resolution OCT image offers new details about pathological conditions which are important for the clinical guidance in cases which corneal opacity doesn't allow adequate clinical evaluation. Dynamic OCT, which is a new issue in this technology, is an excellent tool to evaluate such cases. You simply cannot see the stroma in these cases with this epithelial hyperplasia. And this case that we saw illustrates the stromal bullet that have not been described so far with other OCT models. So it's really a remarkable case. Now let's see this case that patient had a, a hypervirus keratitis, had dark, and in the post-op, the patient had corneal edema because of detached uh, the membrane. This is the aspect of the decimal membrane, and this is one that we did above Why uh, We use uh, OCT scan in every single case after that. And the reason is that we need to see this. If this was this an exaggerated case, believe me, through this thick cornea we were unable to see whether there was a, dis a detachment or not, and the, uh, the, uh, the OCT was clear that was a detachment. Sometimes you have moderate edema, and you don't see whether you have a detached decimal membrane localized, and sometimes you, it happens, this is a major detachment, not visible at the slit lamp, and visible uh, uh, by OCT. The case was treated with bubbling and was replaced. This is another case in which we had sectorial edema following dark, this case uh, was showing like this, so some parts of the cornea, the decimal was attached, but in some others, like you can see here, what partial uh, detachment of the decimal membrane that created, obviously, a segmental uh, increase in the thickness with a corneal edema in these areas. It was difficult to see, it was difficult to understand the case, but here you see how with the bubbling will resolve the case very well, and this is another application that we found. So in, the, in dark and demic, we, we use uh, in every single case OCT images because it, we have found this is an excellent tool. There is nothing similar to OCT to, to follow these cases because the surgical details that observe with this, uh, with this technology guide surgical decisions on the moment because bubbling was done the same day and the resolution happened. We follow up the case instantaneously thanks to the use of the OCT scan. 25 years old, a female, got keratoconus. This is a, the topography we have here, the epithelial map distribution. Again, the, the MS39 gives to you one opportunity. This is a study of the corneal epithelium. The study of the corneal epithelium is for us a keystone in the diagnosis of keratoconus and a keystone in the understanding of how keratoconus treatment is making evolution. The epithelial map today is an extremely important hallmark in keratoconus uh, cases for a diagnostic uh, purpose and high resolution OCT performs multidimensional epithelial analysis and assists the clinician the diagnostic analysis of keratoconus. You can see this in every single case of keratoconus, uh, more or less, but it's an inverted profile. This inverted profile is a Mexican heart profile, is typical of keratoconus even in early stages. Not that remarkable. Either. 66 years old uh, female with cartilage surgery, the patient had this uh, vision was implanted with, uh, with this type of intraocular lenses and, well, and was the subject of PRK. The use of PRK in multifocal lenses has the problem that you have a very long delay in the recovery. This is something that all of you that makes the use of multifocal lenses, you can know, PRK is what we use, but we know 
that the outcome has to be uh, found months after. And the reason is that we have, and you can see here, an extremely high off of the range of epithelial thickness. So PLK induces an increase in the thickness of the epithelium that takes months to solve that really give to us much more than topography, give us the resolution because this is an outstanding result. Okay? Now let's go to this case. This was a uh, natural cement OCT on the two different light stimulus. We have, as you see here, the pupil is dilated, here the pupil is constricted. And we, uh, we're using here uh, an IPCL, which is a new type of posterior chamber fakir lens. Uh, you see here that we have a very good central vault, but you can see on the contrary here that the, the peripheral meniscus is too near to the, to the crystalline lens. If you, under, under contraction, that means when we induce accommodation or we use pyrocarbon, this was because accommodation, look here that there is a direct contact of the peripheral meniscus with the crystalline lens. We could anticipate here that this patient would develop a cataract and he developed an annular cataract. So with OCT here, we should have taken the, 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 the decision here when looking at this, at this distance between the lens in the periphery to the uh, lens, to the natural lens, and here to expand the lens to avoid the induction of a cataract. This is very important and gives to you the resolution and the quality of the image that we have once that we uh, have the possibility to see and the, the possible surface of the cornea and also uh, be aware that these new technologies can have problems because the central ball is no longer in this technology what is necessary to be careful with but also the peripheral part which is usually hidden by the artist. You, you can see here other examples but this is um, an ICL hyperopic. You can see here that the vault here is good and when the pupil is constricted is also good. So the here even that the vault is decreased is still good enough not to have a this problem. So the clear examples how the application of OCT in the study in the possibility of faking intraocular lenses is a key factor in assessing the quality of the surgery and the outcome and to prevent complications based on image. So the, the very high resolution of this uh, device and a very good control of the posterior uh, uh, fake lens surface and the measurement of all. And the things about the dual seven anatomy and crystal lens relations are easy to observe and to measure with anatomy precision. Let me go to this other case in which we have this 29 years old male with keratoconus. Uh, this patient had intrastomal ring segments and toric intraocular lens fixed uh, 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 the R This is the lens. These are the rings, this is the anterior chamber. Again, a huge anterior chamber, but and in spite of the very deep chamber, the resolution is untouched. Look here how, how good is the detail about the bowels. Look here how good is the detail about the anterior posterior surfaces of the lens. This is not possible to be obtained with other devices like the zeros, in which the, the, the anterior segment attachment of this posterior segment uh, device is impossible to achieve this precision, and especially to have all this a death in penetration for the diagnostic image that is necessary. So these complex anatomical conditions of some eyes are analyzed in, per, in, in extreme accuracy by the MS39, offering relevant data about corneal details and jocular structures, even in very deep anterior chambers, which is something that we appreciate a lot because we work a lot with keratoconus, and these are examples of our day, daily life activity. Now let's go to this quite a remarkable case. This is a 22 years female that suffered ocular trauma in the right eye. As a consequence, she developed blindness. The patient is blind. Obviously, she's a young uh, lady. And look here, the horrible aspect of the patient. The patient was unable to use a contact lens and we decided to use keratoconus pigmentation techniques. For those that you don't know, this technology is a technology that we have developed in Alicante in order to, to stain the iris for cosmetic and therapeutic purposes. This is a cosmetic therapeutic indication, the sublime eye, and you can see here how we are uh, reproducing the, the pupil, reproducing the iris in the color of the other eye, and this is the aspect of the case. What is the image of, the, uh, of this uh, unusual cases in the OCT? Obviously, you lose control of, of all the details, but with the OCT in the center, you can still see the cornea, you can see the test of the anterior chamber. Obviously, the, the opaque layer of the pigment uh, prevents you to have any observation behind. So this is a limit that obviously have, but at least you can go and uh, you, you can have in these cases, from this image, when you can see nothing at the center of the people, you can have some observation of the thickness of the cornea and some details. The take-home message here 
is a game that we have a no city standard, gives excellent uh, performance, will modify the convention at the no city in complex cases, sorry. Anchor documentation can be studied by MS39 for certain corner things and other details in this very disease corner. Uh, this is a, a, a device to follow all these cases and indeed has offered extremely useful uh, uh, information uh, for us. This is a, a, another complex case, very good example of how to use the, the MS39, 26 years old female, developed endothelial uh, dystrophy, heart keratoplasty, uh, heart, it was cortical respondent and developed coronary compensation and heart attack. Good morning, all of you. Can you hear me well? Can you hear me well? Yes? Okay. Thank you for coming today. We are going to deal in this uh, 30 minutes that will follow how we use uh, a, a pyramid barometry and the, the, the OCT and the semen OCT MS39 in this uh, approach to the diagnosis and therapy of complex cases in, in cornea cataract refractive surgery. Uh, during this presentation, in order to be more in time, I will not use my part of pyramid barometry. I will focus just in the uh, use of the MS39. So the MS39, as you know, is part of the new technology of this company, CSO, that really is oriented towards the high resolution uh, uh, image, OCT images of the anterior cell in order to make each better diagnosis to complete uh, the diagnosis in many cases and also to make new approaches to therapy and the subject of this presentation is to illustrate to you with clinical cases that we have been studied. We use it a lot with the pyramid barometry with the OSARIS, but uh, OSARIS is not going to be the subject of this presentation because it is too long to do it and, and I don't think we have the time today. So we know that the MS39 characteristics are very particular. It is one of the most advanced and better uh, OCTs uh, dealing with anterior segment because of the resolution and because of the te technology that is involved. That is very easy to use. It's very uh, friendly to use, let me tell you as well. And all this makes uh, it ideal for the clinical practice. And we have obtained since the moment that we had this, this uh, device two years ago an enormous amount of information about our cases and this is why we are and I am going to announce to you going to edit a book that will be ready for the end of this uh, very year about the use of OCT in anterior segment diagnosis. So let's go to clinical cases. So I'm going to show to you one by one clinical cases and I want to discuss them with you and any question or suggestion they will be much welcome for me. This is a case of 28 years female with bilateral keratoconus that had dark with an artisan toric intraocular lens in the side. The patient was uh, 2020 and look at this residual refractor. So this is a remarkable outcome in a very difficult case. Look at how steep is the corner, but especially look how deep is the anterior segment and how good is the, uh, the, the study that we can do on the uh, IUL, which was an artisan, this is I told you. This technology is almost unique in terms of the penetration. You can see the anterior segment and the details of this lens, which is very difficult to, to, to see with any other technology, particularly with the Visante. In this eye, we have uh, this type of performance. You see that we have the bilateral, uh, the, the bidimensional PSF, which is 0.17. It's not perfect, but look, that is quite good. This is why pyramid barometry in conjunction with this device gives to you an immense amount of information. And this is the other eye in which we had a coloring and cross-linking. You see that the case is, uh, the other eye was more advanced. This cornea was different, different, but look here the PSA, which is a little bit better, but not significantly better. You can see here the convoluted image of the, of the, of the uh, barometry. And basically, in both cases, we had a very good outcome. So in this case of severe keratoconus, following two types of surgery, dark with toric uh, iris, iris flow implantation, a very good uncorrective visual acuity was obtained with a marginal refractive error, a very low level of total higher order abrasions as you could see in the surgery. So with this technology we could see not only the anatomy, but also the performance. And the vision was good, but the vision was good almost with similar quality between both eyes. The, the best eye had intracornal resetting that indeed did a good job 
again we can assess the outcome with the pyramidal probability that, that what we see with the OCT. And this case demonstrates how visual restoration can be accomplished with major cornea surgery in the case of cornea graft and intraocular lens fake implantation and properly selected cases for a corneal therapy with intracorneal lens. So this is important and again I want to stress to you that very few machines can take this type of image with this quality in, very, in this huge anterior chamber. So this is the, the first case. This is another case in which we had a, a presbyplasic, the patient was 49 years old male and the outcome was good and this was the pyramidal aberrometry of the case. As you see we have an excellent outcome in terms of convoluted image and the, 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 the bidimensional PSF is really very good as well. This, are, this is the, the outcome of the patient following the therapy. You see here that we have this uh, refraction and we ended in this uh, vision and this refraction which was outstandingly good and you can see here the change in the corneal topography. This is the, the, the image post presbyplasic and in this case we could ascertain with pyramidal barometry the quality of visual outcomes after multifocal corneal uh, ablations like in presbyplasic and indeed we, we tested the outcomes in, uh, in this case with some different second laser. Six millimeter uh, graft perfectly adapted, no contact lens, closing the opening, this is the opening of the case, of the, of the perforation, artificial anterior chamber, a bubble, quite interesting, and the and the third chamber and the and the intraocular lens in place. Quite a remarkable case and indeed very important from the clinical standpoint. So in this case, the technology allows us to make the right choice of the treatment of this complex case with an extremely distorted corneal anatomy and the special details of the case are not visible with conventional microscopy or any other imaging diagnostic technology as we have in this very case. Remarkable case again. This is a case that has 80 years old, uh, underwent lamellar keratectomy. You can see here that the patient had this corneal opacity and this corneal opacity uh, had since evidence of corneal infection. Uh, you can see very clearly because of the arrows cells. The patient had minimal uh, ciliary injection, had flare, had cells, but look at the cells. This was an endophthalmitis. Anterior endophthalmitis can be diagnosed with OCT. This is a remarkable case again. So if you are careful in your observation in these cases, this case not observed in uveitis. Uveitis you have precipitates on the endothelium, you don't have floating particles like here. This is because they were polymorphic uh, nuclear leukocytes floating in the third chamber. Early diagnosis of the endothelmitis, this patient was punctured at the moment. We took a sample, was at the uh, 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 streptococcus epidermis in this case. This happened seven years after the surgery. The patient was immediately treated and we saved the eye before any microbiological uh, diagnosis was evident. Simply by the OCT and microbiology came a couple of days later with a diagnosis. So this is a remarkable case and demonstrates how endothelmitis can be diagnosed with OCT. Okay, this is a case that had at the implantation of artisan a fake lens, this aspect was an awful aspect. Look, we have hyphema, we have endothelial cell uh, deposits from the hematogenous uh, of, of, of origin. The eye is moderately inflamed, but we don't see anything. You know, we don't see anything because the corner is cloudy. This is the aspect of the cells. We have a clot of fibrin in the anterior cha uh, chamber, you know, and this clot of fibrin is because we have a, an angle block. So we have an angle block. You can see here very clearly this was an, um, a, a, a lens that was anterior uh, position and look here how we have a clot of fibrin that obviously is one of the problems. We have in other cases, and I have brought these images in which when you have the flow, the, 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 the hole that today has the ACL, this clot of fibrin can block the hole. So with OCT, these cases can be diagnosed and if you have the flow, uh, the, which is the new avian ICL, you can diagnose this block of the flow uh, 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 opening, which is not impossible to be blocked by postoperative inflammation and uh, in this case you have the evidence how fibrin can be uh, precisely traced and diagnosed and located with the OCT scan. This is another in, important case. We, we, this patient had a refractive surprise, was implanted with a piggy bag in lens and the patient lost vision. We had uh, the observation that this language that uh, apparently nothing was happening, but the patient lost two lines of escort the visual acuity and by OCT you can see the, the reason. The patient is uh, with a back 
sulcus implantation. So this, the idea of this piggyback was to be the sulcus, but the sorium knee was unlucky enough to be with one of the haptics in the back and not in the sulcus. You can see here the impact of the sulcus and how the lens was tilted. What we did was to rotate the lens out from the scapula back and then we had immediate resolution of the case. So a, a lens tilting in piggyback can be diagnosed and you have immediately an image in which you can base your uh, therapy. This is a, a seven years old male uh, with a trauma. This, this kid was uh, hooked with a, with a fisher uh, by a fisherman and left this, this uh, tremendous uh, scar. This scar was analyzed and was uh, detected like this. It was the refraction of the patient was 0.4 with very distorted images due to irregular astigmatism. We thought that to perform laminar keratectomy, excision, with femtosecond laser of 180 microns would be enough to eliminate this scar without any corner graft. This is what we did. Uh, we did PRK, not, la not femtosecond, but PRK. And the case did well. We got pesco of 0.5, 58, with plus 8 minus 2.75, total disappearance of the sky, of the scar. This is the aspect of the PRK. Uh, here we indicated, based on the data, a fake IUL that was implanted. And this is the implantation of the lens. I think that I missed one. Okay, sorry because it's not here. The, this case was implanted with a fake lens artisan and achieved 0.8 visual acuity believer. And during this time, the patients are unhappy, and you have to alert them that this is going to, to happen because there is no way to avoid this at this point. So, the late corneal epithelial regularity, which is the, the problem here, is a reason of the late recovery of visual acuity following in PRK cases, especially in cases of older people implanted with intraocular lenses and particularly uh, problematic in multifocal lens implantation. And this case illustrates how this epithelial uh, thickness increase and irregularity affects the neural adaptation process of premium intraocular lens. Epithelial must be performed in cases with visual loss or doubtful diagnosis following examination, surface ablation, even that they are not. Uh, you have cases in young people that even three months after you don't have the vision and the, and the performance of the vision that should be the epithelial map tells you that you have a hyperplasia, nothing to do but at least you can offer an opinion and a diagnosis to the patient. This is a patient that is a male with 71 years and had keratoconus posticus. How many of you have seen keratoconus posticus? Probably never, right? This posterior keratoconus is a, a very unusual variety of keratoconus. This is a case that uh, in the right eye, the patient, if you are carefully looking here, you see a small cycle and the patient has been implanted with a myelin. The doctor that did this, the, the surgery was not aware of the posterior keratoconus because we had a report and did, to the best of his opinion, an implantation of, of myelin that was successful. In the other eye, the patient had hepatic keratitis and had keratopigmentation uh, in order to the cosmetic problem and a lamellar graft. Let me see you, show to you these details. This is the aspect of Keratoconus posticus in epithelium. As you see, we have a thin epithelium in posterior keratoconus. So, posterior keratoconus not only affects the posterior surface of the canal, affects the epithelial thickness again. And this is something that has never been reported, and this is the first time that has been uh, demonstrated. And not only this, excuse me, but look at, what, at this detail. The Lokisorium uh, made a dissection with femtosecond laser, or manual, I think it was manual, of the cornea. But look here. That thanks to the MS39, you can see this line. This line is the cut, and look that it is only 12 micros between the apex of the posterior keratoconus and the cut. So, this uh, surgery could be complicated with an intraoperative perforation of the central cornea, spoiling the whole thing. And this lucky surgeon did, did a deep implantation of the myelin, successful, thanks God. But look how close 12 microns separates the, the posterior surface of the cornea to the, to the lawyer in which the, 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 implant, the, in which the session was created. Remarkable case and remarkable uh, success. This is again, I want to show to you posterior keratoconus with no topographic evidence and terror segment. Look how is uh, the, the aspect. The aspect is an inverted a Mexican flag. A Mexican uh, hat identical to an anterior surface keratoconus. Remarkable 
We are going, uh, this has been the subject of publication. You can read this paper in the European Journal of Thermology. It's a remarkable case. Posterior cardiac bonus diagnosis never studied before with OCT and never to this detail, obviously. This epithelial thickness map, and that's it. So this unusual case of cardiac bonus positive demonstrates how epithelial map is also altered in the absence of arterial bulking. The clinical anatomy of this case is an example of the wide possibilities of MS39. You cannot implant definitely an intracoronary ring without an OCT image. In my opinion, it's malpractice and you have to know that. You can miss the diagnosis of keratoconus posticus. You are not very good in the slit lamp observation. In this very rare and difficult case of coronary disease. But what happened with the second eye? Because this patient was unfortunate enough to have a posterior keratoconus with a risk of perforation in one eye, but the other eye was uh, virtually blind and had a, per a perforated uh, cornea due to the uh, presence of a uh, necrotic herpetic keratitis. The patient had a disabled, uh, uh, a cosmetically disabled eye and was a surgery one year before of the of, of keratopigmentation. This is a superficial keratopigmentation. You can see here the pigment, okay, distributed in the sub-epithelial layer of the cornea. But due to the relapse, when the patient abandoned a cyclobid therapy, the patient developed a perforation. You can see here this perforation that is there. And look here how is the perforation contained. You have the intraocular lens and this blocking the, the, the perforation. And this is how the patient was saving the eye. And this is the bandage contact lens that we use. In this case, there was a, the, the patient didn't want to get a, a enucleated. There was no other solution than to implant a lamellar graft. And we did a lamellar graft the private from the endothelium and you can see here in the next slide that we have the lens back in the natural position you can you have here the perforation that was not not small at all you have here an, an, a, a, let's say a double anterior chamber and this is the laminar graph that we did with inverted profile or not excellent and this is because we guided thanks to the use of the OCT how deep should be the penetration of the P of the PRK procedure, PTK, excuse me, not PRK, but PTK is a mistake. Or we are doing these cases today also better with the use of endosecond lens. Here we have the VR technology. The vision ring is a ring that is flat, that means that that reduces a lot the risk of extrusion. It can be implanted to 1.5 millimeters, doesn't need to have a larger incision, and this is the aspect of the ring in terms of depth. This patient achieved an excellent outcome, and you can see here the profile of this flat ring that is one of our developments for the treatment of keratoconus. And okay, this well, this was just to show to you how is the aspect of, uh, and, and the modulation that has the image in a case of, of a ring implantation is a 270 ring in a keratoconus case, which was very interesting. Sorry not to be able to do that. This is a patient, a patient that had PRK in 1995, had this scar and was never uh, treated. The patient had this vision and in the, I hope that it would run because it's very, very interesting to see how we can detect it's not running. The driver of this computer is different than mine. But here, the, the interesting issue is how, how you can trace the different deaths of this scar that is due to an all-performed PRK inside the cornea. The patient was the uh, uh, the PTK, and the patient improved immensely the vision. And look here how we have made it possible to disappear, guided by the OCT image in this case. And now, this is the last case that I want to show to you today. It's a terminal, terminal, terminal infantile glaucoma that was sent to us for corneal transplantation. The patient was still sighted, had a, a, a color projection and perception, and hand movement, and was sent for corneal transplantation. But when we did the OCT scan, look here that we have a huge a hypertrophy of the epithelium. This epithelial hypertrophy was that thick to be almost 400 microns, almost the thickness of the cornea. So, but you can see here that the cornea is transparent. So we decided to change the indication and we did laminar excision of the hyperplastic epithelium. You can see here how we are dissected from a peripheral incision, this, uh, this tissue. This tissue was um, clearly the reason of the opacity and underneath we had a transparent cornea. So this patient avoids an, uh, an infantile graft that you know harbors many complications in the postdoc. Look how, how transparent was the cornea. 
we had an excellent uh, visual vis contemplation was 0.2 and finally we avoided major surgery and obviously the cosmetics, the cosmetics of the patient were very much improved. This was the aspect pre and post and after three years this patient never relapsed of this apical hyperplasia. And well, I, th I have to stop here because the lack of time. I'm happy to have any question from your side, but I want to summarize that today in a third segment, a clinic and therapy and surgery, we cannot live without high resolution OCT. OCT is performed in every single case, either to, 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 to have the, to the tomography of the cornea, the thickness, to study the epithelium, for a laminar graph to calculate the depth of the graph. If we are going to use femtosecond to calculate the depth, of the incision that we are going to make in anterior segment in which the cornea is opaque to see what happens in anterior segment in glaucoma surgery because I have more images you can see the, 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 the stems that you were implanted today easily you need some expertise on that and finally the fact the surgical cases combined with the, uh, with the primary barometer the osiris is indeed a great deal and you uh, uh, improve immensely your diagnostic capability and your efficacy as well thank you very much for your kind attention and again thank you, thank you. Yes, doctor.